I grew up in a nominal Roman Catholic family and was raised to revere Mary and the Pope. I finished my first communion, learned how to pray the rosary, and even went to church on rare occasions. I never questioned the legitimacy of my religion until I had a turning point in my life and started truly seeking God and reading the Bible. After that happened, it changed everything. And that's what I'm going to be talking about in this video as I present to you 10 reasons why I left the Roman Catholic Church. But before I do, make sure to subscribe to my channel and click the bell so you don't miss any of my future uploads. I post new videos every Thursday and live stream every Sunday. Let's get right into it. Number one, the Pope is not the Holy Father. One of the Pope's unofficial titles is Holy Father. This is a title that belongs to God alone. When Jesus was praying for his apostles to the Father in John chapter 17 verse 11, he said, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. The Bible tells us that claiming to be equal with God is blasphemy. When Jesus said that him and the Father are one, John chapter 10 verse 33 says, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Therefore the Pope is committing blasphemy by allowing people to call him Holy Father. Not to mention, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 23 verse 9, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. What's interesting to note is that some of the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day used the title Father, or Abba, in Aramaic at the beginning of their name. And the reason Jesus said to avoid calling people Father in a religious sense according to Barnes' notes on the Bible, is because the word Father also denotes authority, eminence, superiority, a right to command, and a claim to particular respect. In this sense, it is used here. In this sense, it belongs eminently to God, and it is not right to give it to people. Christian brethren are equal. Only God has supreme authority. By the way, this not only applies to the Pope, but Catholic priests as well, who use the title of Father at the beginning of their name. But I'll be talking more about Catholic priests later. Number 2. Mary can't hear your prayers. The Catholic Church claims that Mary is in heaven now, and that she is a co-redeemer with Christ. But if you've watched my video entitled 10 Facts About Death, you'll know that's not true. Most believers are asleep in the grave, waiting to be resurrected at the second coming of Christ. Now, there are some exceptions, including Enoch, Moses, and Elijah, who are in heaven now, according to the Bible. But the Bible never says that Mary went to heaven. But according to Catholic dogma, the Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. This teaching is called the Assumption of Mary. And according to the Catholic Church, she intercedes for sinners and the grace of Jesus her Son is bestowed through her. There's an official title for this role that Mary plays which was invented by the Catholic Church called Mediatrix. Therefore, Catholics are encouraged to pray to her and ask her to intercede on behalf of their prayers. However, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verse 5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Not to mention communication with the dead is specifically forbidden by the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verses 10 through 12 says, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, 
or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. A necromancer is someone that communicates with the dead. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. An abomination is something that is especially offensive to God. And the reason why God doesn't want us communicating with the dead is because those spirits who claim to be departed spirits of the dead are actually demons in disguise, pretending to be dead people to deceive us and lead us away from God and the truths of His Word. Number 3. Priests Can't Forgive Your Sins The Roman Catholic Church teaches that priests have the right to absolve people of their sins through the act of confession. But when Jesus told a paralytic man that his sins were forgiven, Mark chapter 2 verses 6 through 7 says, But there was certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? When a man claims to be able to forgive people for their sins, that is blasphemy. One of the ways the church justifies this is by quoting John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23, which states, Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Jesus said this to Peter and the apostles, and the Catholic Church claims that since Peter was the first pope, which there's no actual biblical or historical evidence of, this applies to the priests as well, and this gives them the right to absolve people of their sins during confession. But this is not what this passage is talking about at all. When Jesus told Peter and the apostles that they have the right to retain or remit sins, it was in the context of the mission that he gave them to preach the gospel. He said they had the ability to forgive or not forgive sins after telling them he was sending them out into the world and giving them the Holy Spirit. This is parallel to Mark chapter 16 verses 15 through 16 where Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And the Holy Spirit was given to the apostles for the express purpose of preaching the gospel. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The proclamation of the gospel includes a call to repentance. Speaking of Jesus, Luke chapter 24 verse 47 says, Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Therefore, the authority bestowed on the church by Christ to forgive or not forgive is the authority to preach the gospel and decide who can or cannot be baptized based on whether or not they have believed the gospel and repented. Number 4. The Rosary is Useless The Rosary is a devotion in honor of the Virgin Mary and it consists of a set number of specific prayers. Certain beads on the rosary represent a certain prayer or number of prayers. On the website, howtopraytherosaryeveryday.com, it gives instructions on how to pray the rosary in 14 steps. A few of the steps include praying several sets of Hail Marys. For example, step 3 says to pray 3 Hail Marys, and step 6, 10, and 11 say to pray 10 Hail Marys. That's a total of 33 Hail Marys. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 verses 7 through 8, But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. 
Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. Just because you pray a certain prayer more, like the Hail Mary, doesn't mean you have a better chance of getting heard by God. Not to mention, we shouldn't be praying to Mary anyway. And why are so many prayers in the rosary directed to Mary instead of God? That's kind of odd, don't you think? There's over 30 prayers to Mary and like 5 or 6 prayers directed to God. Not to mention, during the rosary, some prayers require Catholics to refer to Mary as the Queen of Heaven and their life and hope. You never find Mary being called the Queen of Heaven in the Bible. The only time you find the phrase Queen of Heaven used in the Bible is in reference to the worship of a pagan idol which God did not approve of. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 18 says, The children gather wood, and the fathers kindle the fire, and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the Queen of Heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods, that they may provoke me to anger. And Mary is not our life and hope. Jesus is. He died for our sins to give us the hope of eternal life in paradise restored. Number 5. The Sacraments Cannot Save You According to the website catholic.org, there are seven sacraments in the church. Baptism, Confirmation, Eucharist, Penance, Anointing of the Sick, Matrimony, and Holy Orders. It goes on to say the sacraments impart grace, but in addition, the very act of celebrating them disposes the faithful most effectively to receive this grace in a fruitful manner, to worship God rightly, and to practice charity. Therefore, you need to do the sacraments in order to receive the grace of God. That's work-based salvation. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We receive the grace of God which leads to salvation through faith, not keeping the sacraments, and someone who is saved will get baptized and do good works. Baptism and good works follow salvation. The Catholic Church has it the other way around. Number 6. Infant baptism will not help your baby. Since I was born into a Catholic family, I was baptized as an infant. The Roman Catholic Church teaches that it's necessary to baptize infants because of original sin. Original sin means not only have they inherited the sinful and fallen nature of Adam and Eve, but also their guilt. So infants need to get baptized to be free from this sin. Otherwise, they could end up in limbo. Limbo comes from the Latin word limbus, which means edge or boundary, and it refers to the edge of hell. Now, it is true that we are born with a sinful, fallen nature, King David wrote in Psalm chapter 51 verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. But to say that we have inherited Adam and Eve's guilt for sinning is not biblical. The Bible makes this clear in Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, stating, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. We are only held accountable for our sins, not the sins of others. Not to mention that would be contrary to God's character because the Bible says that God is a just God and it would be unfair for him to hold us accountable for Adam and Eve's sins. So children are not held accountable for the guilt of Adam and Eve's sins. And many scholars believe that they are not held accountable for their own sins until they reach the age of accountability. The age of accountability is a theory with some scriptural backing that claims children are not held accountable for their sins until they reach an age where they are mature enough to understand right from wrong 
and basic elements of the gospel. For example, James chapter 4 verse 17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But besides that, there are no examples of children getting baptized in the Bible. No one ever got baptized by sprinkling in the Bible either, which is how the Catholic Church baptizes infants. And baptism functions as a public profession of our faith. It's symbolic. When we get taken under the water, that represents our death to our old life of sin. And when we come up, that represents our new life in Christ. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 4 puts it this way, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. You can't make that commitment as a baby. That's why you only have examples of adults getting baptized in the Bible, because they are mature enough to understand that. Number 7. Purgatory is not real. In Catholic theology, Purgatory is a place that believers go to when they haven't been completely purified of some sins that are keeping them from heaven. There are three essential components to purgatory. Number one, that a purification after death exists. Number two, that it involves some kind of pain. And number three, that the purification can be assisted by the prayers and offerings of the living to God. The problem with this is that the Bible says once we die, there are no second chances for us to make it into heaven. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. After we die, we have to face the judgment which determines whether or not we go to heaven. Now, the judgment does not immediately get executed after we die. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1 mentions Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. But until then, the dead sleep in the grave, and God's judgment is going to be based on our works in this life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. And the reason we are judged by our works is because they prove whether or not we have genuine saving faith. Remember, James chapter 2 verse 26 says, Faith without works is dead. So purgatory is not true. And not only is it not true, it's very dangerous. It can lead people to believe that it's not necessary to repent from all of their known sins because they will be cleansed of them in purgatory before entering into heaven. But whatever you don't repent of, God can't forgive you. And you will be held accountable for that on judgment day and God won't allow you into heaven. The reason being is because you will still have a rebellious character and you will ruin the atmosphere of heaven. Not to mention, the Bible says that God is love. And it wouldn't be very loving of God to force people into heaven who don't want to completely follow God. It would make them miserable. So he only gives people what they want. Number 8. The Roman Catholic Church changed God's law. Well, at least it tried to change God's law. Nobody can really change God's law. But did you know that if you compare the Ten Commandments from the Catholic Catechism to the Ten Commandments in the Bible in Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, the Catechism omits the Second Commandment. It's not there. That's the one that forbids idolatry. It's in verses 4 through 6, and it says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image, or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, 
or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And it's no wonder why the Catholic Church has omitted that since Catholics pray to statues and images of Mary and the saints and also to the cross. That is idolatry. And since the Catechism leaves out the second commandment in the Bible, it has split the tenth commandment into two to make their nine commandments look like ten. That's why the ninth and tenth commandment in the Catechism is about coveting when really that's just one commandment in the Bible. Not only that, the fourth commandment, the one that tells us to keep the seventh day Sabbath holy, has been dramatically shortened in the Catechism. In the Bible, it's four verses long. I mean, it's like a paragraph. It says to keep the Sabbath holy on the seventh day of the week, to not do any work, and that it's a memorial of creation. In the Catechism, it just says, Remember to keep holy the Lord's Day. And the reason why the Catechism excludes all of that information about the Sabbath being on the seventh day and whatnot is because the seventh day of the week is Saturday and the Catholic Church tells people to keep Sunday holy. They're telling people to keep the wrong day. They actually changed it from Saturday to Sunday and admit to changing it. For example, the Catechism of the Council of Trent says, The Church of God has thought it well to transfer the celebration and observance of the Sabbath to Sunday. But Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 2 says, Ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish aught from it, that ye may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. No man has a right to change or try to change God's law. And did you know Bible prophecy warned us about this? Speaking about the papacy, the leadership of the Roman Catholic Church, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 25 says, And he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws. And they shall be given into his hand until a time and times, and the dividing of time. Bible prophecy actually has a lot to say about the Roman Catholic Church. And it's not very good. But it's not against the people in the religion per se. It's because the religious institution has become corrupt. Number 9. The Roman Catholic Church has a bloody past. For a church that claims to be the one true church ordained directly by the pure and holy Jesus Christ, it sure has done a lot of killing. Irish historian William Lecky said that the Church of Rome has shed more innocent blood than any other institution that has ever existed among mankind will be questioned by no Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. The memorials, indeed, of many of her persecutions are now so scanty that it is impossible to form a complete conception of the multitude of her victims, and it is quite certain that no power of imagination can adequately realize their sufferings. And the Anglican scholar Dr. Henry Guinness wrote, It has been calculated that the popes of Rome have directly or indirectly slain 50 millions of men and women who refused to be parties to Romish idolatries, who held to the Bible as the Word of God. The Catholic Church accomplished this through religious wars, crusades, and the Inquisition. And how it was able to do this is by using the power of the state. In medieval times, when the Catholic Church had religious supremacy in the known world, there was a church-state union between the church and many European countries. Whenever a person 
or group of people resisted the authority or teachings of the Catholic Church, that was considered an act of heresy against the church and treason against the state. And treason is punishable by death. Therefore, authorities from the state would be dispatched to apprehend and punish those dissenters. A lot of the people killed by the Catholic Church were professed Christians. Now, they didn't always have correct theology, but neither did the Roman Catholic Church, but that doesn't give the Catholic Church the right to have them killed. For example, in one day, on July 22nd, 1209 AD, 20 to 70,000 Albigensians were killed in Bazir's France by the order of Pope Innocent III. Albigensians considered themselves Christians, even though they had some Gnostic beliefs. This was the beginning of a 20-year crusade to wipe out all Cathars, which was a religious body that the Albigensians belonged to. After that crusade had ended, the Inquisition was established in 1232 AD to search for and destroy surviving and hiding Cathars. The last Cathar was burned at the stake in 1324 AD. And when it was over, an estimated 1 million Cathars had been killed. And there were many other professedly Christian groups that were persecuted and killed by the Catholic Church, including the Waldensians, Paulicians, Runcarians, and Josephites, to name a few. And there were crusades and wars against Protestants after the Reformation had begun. In the 15th century, thousands of Hussites were slain. In 1572, 20,000 Huguenots were killed. In the 17th century, Catholics sacked the city of Magdeburg, Germany, and wiped out 30,000 Protestants. Also in the 17th century, the 30 years war between Catholics and Protestants in Germany led to the elimination of about 40% of the country's population. The fact that the Catholic Church was responsible for so much persecution and death throughout history goes to show that it has completely departed from God. Jesus told his apostles in John chapter 16 verses 2 through 3, They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. Those who are intolerant to the religious convictions of others to the point that they persecute and kill them, apparently don't know God and are not doing His will. They are doing the devil's will. When Jesus was addressing the Jews who were trying to kill Him, in John chapter 8, verse 44, he said, Ye are of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. Not to mention, church and state should remain separate. Jesus made that clear in Matthew chapter 22, verse 21, when he said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. Because once church and state unite, it's only a matter of time before intolerance and persecution is exercised against minority groups who don't accept the state-sanctioned religion. Number 10. The Catholic Mass Violates Jesus During the Catholic Mass, the Eucharist is celebrated where the host, which is that round-looking wafer, is believed to transform into the literal body of Jesus and the wine into the literal blood of Jesus. This is called transubstantiation. There are several problems with this. One of them is that the Eucharist is not meant to be taken literally. It's symbolic. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses 23 through 26 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. 
do this in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Jesus said that the bread and wine of the Eucharist are a memorial that is a symbol of Jesus' death and we are to celebrate it in honor of his sacrifice until he returns. Not to mention, I participate in the Lord's Supper at church, which is what we call the Eucharist, on a regular basis, and I never notice the bread or wine tasting like flesh or blood, so that's just weird. In addition, the Bible discourages believers from eating blood several times, both in the Old and New Testament. Leviticus chapter 19 verse 26 says, You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall ye use enchantment, nor observe times. And Acts chapter 21 verse 25 says, But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having decided that they should abstain from meat sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. Not only that, in the Mass, Jesus is sacrificed for our sins over and over, since the Catholic Church teaches that the Eucharist is meant to be taken literally. The website catholic.com states, The Eucharist is a true sacrifice, not just a commemorative meal, as Bible Christians insist. But numerous Bible verses make it clear that Jesus died for our sins once and for all. For example, 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. To say that the Eucharist is a true sacrifice is to say that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross wasn't enough. And if you think that's strange, it gets even more bizarre because Catholics are taught that they need to worship the Eucharist because it contains the physical body and blood of Jesus. CatholicNewsAgency.com says, We must worship the Eucharist. In worshiping the Eucharist, we are not worshiping a piece of bread or a cup of wine. In worshiping the Eucharist, we are not sinning. We are not committing idolatry. Idolatry is when you worship something or someone who is not God. The Eucharist is God. I'm sorry, I am not going to worship a bread wafer. The Catholic Church has a lot of strange and bizarre teachings and practices which are not only completely unbiblical, but blasphemous and even dangerous. The Pope allows people to call him Holy Father, a title that belongs to God. Mary is believed to be able to intercede on behalf of your prayers, even though the Bible makes it clear that she's dead, waiting for the resurrection at Jesus' second coming. Priests think they can absolve you of your sins, when they are just men who need their sins forgiven just as much as the rest of us, sometimes even more. The grace of God is received through the Catholic sacraments. You have a second chance at heaven if you suffer in purgatory to cleanse you for your sins. And they worship a piece of bread and say that it is God. Lord, have mercy. Anyway, after learning these things and how they contradict the Bible so much, I made a decision to leave the Catholic Church. I made a decision to follow Jesus and God's Word, because God's Word is truth. Speaking of the Word, Jesus said in John chapter 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy Word is truth. If you're a Catholic and having some doubts about your church, like I did, and you're looking for a Bible-based church to attend, click on the link in the video description called Find a Church Near You. Then, use the Church Locator tool to find a church almost anywhere in the world. If you'd like to learn more about the Roman Catholic Church and Bible prophecy, I highly recommend the 3DVD documentary set, including the Cosmic Conflict, Origin of Evil, 
final events of Bible prophecy, and Revelation, The Bride, The Beast, and Babylon from Amazing Facts. I've watched all of these myself and like them a lot. They're on sale right now on the Amazing Facts website for $29.95, and I'll include a link in the video description which you can click on to buy them. It's an affiliate link, so if you use it to make your purchase, I'll earn some commission, which will help support my channel. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like it and share it. And check out some more of my videos by clicking on the screen. I have a lot of good Christian videos, which I'm sure you'll enjoy if you liked this one. Thank you for watching, and God bless you.